Well, hello, everyone. Today is uh, a sermon about Pentecost, getting ready for Pentecost. I call Pentecost a transition day. It definitely pictures things that happened in the past. For example, we believe the Torah was given on the Ten Commandments and the Torah was given on or in very near Pentecost, if you go by the timing given in Exodus 19 and 20. Of course, we know that Acts 2 was given definitely on Pentecost. Very, very definitely, it says so. And that was the giving of the Holy Spirit. And much more was implied by the giving of that Holy Spirit, which we'll talk about today. It's very exciting today, actually, to understand what Pentecost is all about. It's so many, so many, many things. And I'm going to have to give a second sermon as well. But today I want to talk about the uh, God's covenanting with us and something to do with engagement and the seed and his divine nature. I think you'll find it exciting. At least I found it very exciting preparing for it. So buckle up and let's get started. It's a magnificent day. It really is. So I hope all of you ministers who are preaching on this day find it exciting because it really is an exciting day and the brethren have to get excited about it. Uh, in 2021, when I'm giving this, Pentecost is May 16. Sometimes it's in June. Uh, in my next sermon, I'll cover what Pentecost is all about, the one I'll give tonight or tomorrow. And, um, uh, but in today's sermon, I want to basically cover some points that I, I, I just want to brush up on some things that we rush right over sometimes and how God is going to finish the course with us and all of that. I, I want to begin by just reminding us that in Acts 2, when it talks about the uh, church coming together, they were, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one place, in one accord. Imagine that. All of the believers at that time, after all the preaching of Yeshua, after 500 had seen him go up to heaven, 120 showed up for Pentecost. And they showed up on a holy day. There are some people who believe we don't keep the holy days. Well, God's New Testament covenant church, uh, the New Covenant Church, began on a holy day called Pentecost, called Shavuot in Hebrew. Feast of Weeks, they were all together, one accord. It was a very difficult time. Yeshua had just been crucified and resurrected. They saw him fly up or rise up to heaven. They saw that happen. In Acts 1, you can read about that. And um, there was some fear initially. They've killed our leader. Will they come after us next? And we know they did. They tried to. And they killed James. And I think in Acts 12, we read about that, the brother of John. And uh, they tried to kill Peter. They certainly killed Stephen in Acts 7. And so, um, but look at all the body of believers today. We're all scattered. And there certainly is persecution of believers in many parts of the world today. And I hope you're praying for them. So, but we're scattered. We won't get together. In many cases, I think it's because uh, the leadership. We don't want to be under certain leadership or some won't get together because it might mean some doctrinal differences that have to be taught. Whatever it is, we're not one accord. So I'm looking forward to that time. They were of one accord, at least in the beginning. What a testimony to all of us now in our end time churches of God. And so I preach myself here too. I try to, as much as I can, uh, visit other groups, uh, Sabbath keeping groups, you know, and uh, I have I have attended the Feast of Tabernacles with different groups. Paul even periodically would go to Jewish synagogues. I've been to Jewish synagogue, um, not as a rule, but I have. And Hebrew roots groups, I've attended them once in a while, although I find them difficult to really be something that I can get wholeheartedly behind because most of them teach a renewed covenant, not a new covenant, but renewed covenant. I know I had my transmission go and in my old car, and I decided to get a rebuilt, a renewed transmission. It's not the same as a new one. And a renewed covenant is really the old one just cleaned up, brushed up a bit. And that's, that's not what, what God said he would give us. You go back and read for yourself in Jeremiah 31, verses 31. 1 to 33, and you'll see that 
time is coming, I will give you my new covenant, and it, it will not be like the one I gave you when I led you by the hand to Mount Sinai, to Horeb. And uh, this one will not be like that one. And uh, this is one, of course. And anyway, I have a sermon on the new and the old covenant and why, why it's not a renewed covenant. Just type in uh, new covenant or renewed covenant, and uh, the sermon should pop up. Type in the search bar. So welcome to Light on the Rock. I am Philip Shields, and um, I'm the founder and host of Light on the Rock, this free website. It is absolutely free. Uh, please tell others about it. We don't have funds to do advertising, so I really would appreciate your help. So let's go to the home page. I want to just go over this real quickly with you. And at the top of the home page, we, at the very top, I'll come back to that in a minute, but we also normally have the scripture for the month. And this one here this month, I'm talking about Acts 2. So we start with scripture for the month, and then you scroll down. I hope we're doing that behind me. And then um, you see the video sermons. And then below that, we have the audio sermons. Audio, is, all you hear is audio. Video, you have the video and the audio together. With the video sermons, you get the scriptures in there. Um, so then you go further down, be, below audio sermons, you see the blogs. A blog is a short article. And um, I think you'll find a lot of the topics and they're very interesting. So I hope you'll check it out. Now, if you pop right up to the very pop, top again, you'll see where it says Light on the Rock at the left. And then it says home and then videos as, you, as I go to the right at the top. Sermons, blogs about Light on the Rock, L-O-T-R. Donate to L-O-T-R if God so leads you to do that. Uh, we thank you in advance for those of you who are doing that. The very few, by handful, that's it. <laughs> but we do appreciate it. Help us stay on the air. Contact us. And we uh, certainly use the funds primarily for keeping us on the air and also for helping a uh, group in Kenya that have uh, 30 orphan kids that uh, we're educating and feeding and taking care of. Anyway, so look down again. We'll come down to the search bar. I want you all to learn how to use the search bar. It's best to just use a word or two, not, not more than three. Uh, so, for example, if you want to learn more about Pentecost, just type in Pentecost. Let's do it right now. Pentecost, and you'll see sermons on the meaning of Pentecost popping right up. And so then as you scroll down, you'll see sermons like about, because we typed in Pentecost, cherishing, cherishing your calling as first fruits, who had God's spirit before Acts 2, uh, Pentecost fivefold meaning. I don't know if all these will show up exactly in this order, or if, but there'll be sermons about Pentecost. I go prepare a place for you. Uh, having to do with Pentecost, I really believe. I hope you, I hope you will check that one out. The search bar is key. Again, just a word or two. Uh, type in Holy Spirit and see what comes up. You might see sermons about cherishing, cherishing the gift of the Holy Spirit, bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, being led by the Spirit or being filled by the Spirit. 22 things the Holy Spirit does for us. Anyway, so I, I hope you'll uh, learn to use the search bar. We have hundreds and hundreds of sermons. We have many, many hundreds of blogs. And we have, I forget how many dozens, certainly, of videos now already. So if it's a topic you're interested in, uh, or if you can't find it on the search bar, let me know. Do the contact us or just write a comment and register and comment that I'd sure like to have a sermon on and then give me the topic. And as I feel led to do it by God's Spirit, I'll do it. So back to the exciting preamble of the meaning of Pentecost in God's plan. There's a preamble to it. Um, remember, again, the New Testament church started on this holy day. We know early believers received the Holy Spirit on this first New Covenant Pentecost. I recommend you hear the sermon titled, 22 Things the Holy Spirit Does for Us. One thing it does that I want to focus on briefly, maybe not so briefly, <laughs> Holy Spirit, God uses the Holy Spirit to start His divine family, His family, to beget us into His family. I recommend you look up the sermon titled, or at least the two words you need would be Breathtaking Destiny. Your Breathtaking Destiny is a two or three part sermon. I recommend, if you haven't heard that, that you do hear that. Understand what I mean by God's family. The child of a dog is a dog. The child of a horse is a horse. The child of a hawk is a hawk. The child of a carrot is a carrot. So what is the child of God? We know who the first child of God, Yeshua, the firstborn of many brethren, of many brothers. 
He's the firstborn of many brothers. Anyway, so that's a hint as to what you might find in that series called Breathtaking Destiny. I said God uses his Holy Spirit to beget us, to keep us, and keep in mind our Father, though he uses the Holy Spirit to beget us, our Father is not the Holy Spirit. Our Father is God the Father. He uses the Holy Spirit to beget us. God's Spirit is many things, but one of the things it's called in, in the Bible is God's seed. I'll read it to you, and we'll put it on the screen. 1 Peter 1, verses 22 and 23. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. Now that phrase, through the Spirit, is not in any of the modern translations. This is why I like the translations from King James and New King James. They use old manuscripts. The newer uh, translations decided to use other Greek manuscripts. And so many key words are left out. So many. This is one phrase right here that's left out. Through the Spirit, you're able to obey the truth. That is so true. And you take that phrase out, you're taking out a lot. Anyway, since you purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Here we have, having been born again. Now, some get into a big contest. Should that say begotten or, be, or born? I'll talk about that in a minute. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed. The word there means seed, just like uh, wheat seed or barley seed, seed, but incorruptible seed through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Now, born again, having been born again in the Greek, the Greek word there is genao, G-E-N-N-A-O. And we post that word up there, Scott, uh, genao. It's used in both ways. It's uh, translated both ways, both as begotten or begot, begat, or as born. Context would tell you what is meant, but it truly is used of both. For example, it is said in Matthew 1 verse 2 that Abraham begot Isaac. It would be wrong to say Abraham gave birth to Isaac. So that obviously is begot. The word there is genau. And other scriptures give you uh, words that clearly show that they're talking about someone who's been born. Matthew 2, verse 1, the next chapter. When Jesus had been born in Bethlehem, he wasn't begotten in Bethlehem. He was born there. The same word, genau, again. So please, let's not fight over begotten or, or born. All right, in some cultures, uh, they consider your birth date their, their, uh, your conception date as best as they can figure it. But anyway, that verse is clearly born there, genau. Either translation can be right depending on context. Usually the context clears it up. But my main point here is not genau. My main point here is that we receive God's spirit. We receive God's seed, his incorruptible seed that begets us as his children, or begotten children, into his family. Someday we'll be totally born of him, we'll be totally in his glory. In 1 John 3, verses 1 to 3, says that we shall see God, God the Father, as he is, for we shall be like him. And that means that uh, we'll be spirit like him and we'll be born of him. But though we're begotten by the seed of God, the seed is not the Father. God is our Father. For example, Yeshua, the Son of God, had God the Father as his Father, but it, Mary was told by the angel, he, uh, the, Luke put it up here, Luke 1, verse 35, I'll start there, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power, here she calls the Spirit, the power of the highest, will overshadow you. And Peter called it the seed of God begets us. Here she says the power of the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One who is to be born from you will be called the Son of God. The angel didn't say he'll be called the Son of the, angel, uh, of the, of the Holy Spirit. So Peter calls the Spirit both God's seed. The angel calls the Spirit God's power. There are other definitions of it. It's both. 
And you're going to see that it's also God's presence. It's part of God himself. In the same way, even we are given God's seed and we're begotten in the family of God. Um, Yeshua was begotten by God's seed, God's spirit, and so are we. Romans 8, verses 9 and 10. In fact, if you don't have God's spirit, if you don't have God's seed, how can you possibly be in the family of God? So how precious is this concept of it being the seed of God that gives us his very DNA, if you will, his very presence, his very, uh, how precious that is. And very exciting, I hope. If you really understand this, what I'm saying, this is very exciting. Romans 8, verse 9 and 10, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. So now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So here we see Spirit of God and Spirit of Christ being used interchangeably. It comes from God the Father through Christ. And so it's the same Spirit, one Spirit, remember, one God, one Lord, one Spirit. And if Christ is in you. You have the Spirit of Christ, and now means now he's saying in verse 10, he's not just saying if the Spirit is in you. He says, but if Christ is. Christ himself is in you, obviously by the Spirit. But here he's equating the very presence of God, as you'll see even more as we go along. It's a very exciting day. All this happened on the day of Pentecost. The body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. John 14, 23, we'll be turning over there. The Holy Spirit, I really believe, is part of God's very essence through the Father and the Son, who make their home in us. They actually come live inside of us. Are you grasping what I'm saying? God is omnipresent. God is omnipresent. That word just came to me right now to use, and I'm going to mark it in my notes, so you, the rest of you seeing this will see it. The Holy Spirit is not just their power. It's not just the power of God. It's not just the seed of God. It is part of what God is, what makes God what God is. It's God's very presence. Let that sink in. That when you have God's Holy Spirit, you have God himself. Remember we read the verse in Romans 8, verse 10. Now if Christ is in you, Romans 8, 10, can you pop that up there again? The body is dead. If Christ is in you, verse 9, I just already said, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're, you're not his. But if Christ is in you, so are you seeing how I'm saying the Spirit is actually picturing the very presence of God himself. So John 14, 23, let this sink in what I'm saying because it should be very, very exciting. John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to, said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. See, God the Father loves you. In fact, Jesus said that, that God loves us as much as he loved Yeshua. Hard to believe. Hard to believe, but there's a scripture that says that. And we will come, I think it's in John 17. And we will come to him, and we will come to him. Not just our spirit will come to him. We will come to him and make our home with him. Make our home with him. Let that sink in. That should be extremely exciting. Now, I'm going to... Um, Try to find that verse where it says that God loves us as much as he loves Yeshua. It's either in John 14, 15, or 17, one of those. Anyway, did you get that? Yeshua, the Son of God, is saying, um, if anyone loves me, Father and I will both come and live inside of you and make your body our home. I've given two sermons recently on total surrender. This has everything to do with that. So what an honor this is. Through God's Spirit, the Father, God the Father himself, Yeshua, come live and dwell inside of us. They move in. They move in. We become the dwelling place of God, also called the temple of God's Spirit in other places. But if we haven't totally surrendered to our Father and to Yeshua, what we do is we say to God the Father and Yeshua in practical terms, why don't you take that part of the house over there, and that's your bathroom over there, 
and this part here belongs to us and this part this door here we keep locked see he's not a guest in our home my father when i was growing up i remember a, a picture of the long-haired jesus on the wall i don't remember all the words now many of you will recognize it though it said something like jesus christ the unseen guest at every meal the silent listener to every conversation and went on from there he's not the unseen guest i covered in the surrender sermons god owns me god owns you god bought you with the blood of christ when you own something if i own this pen here i can do whatever i want with this pen I can cherish it and protect it, or I can throw it in the garbage. I can lose it or I can keep it. If I lose it, I might go looking for it. If I really love it a lot, God goes looking for us if we get lost. He owns us, our life, our, the, where he's made his home. Ponder that. God has moved in, into a house, our life, that he owns. And a lot of us, though, don't give him the run of the house. We, let it, we, we say you can have this part or that part. And they, they're acting more like a guest instead of a full-time resident or even owner. Guests are limited, like I said, to certain areas. But residents can have the run of the house. God owns us. So now he should own what we, have, what we do. And what is Christ doing outside his own house, outside his, the door? He's the door. He's the house. In, I think it's Revelation 3.20, the latest scenes, I knock on the door. If you hear me knocking, open the door, I'll come and have dinner with you. It's supposed to be his dwelling place. What's he doing outside? And I'm telling you, a lot of us are not praying enough. A lot of us are not reading the word of God enough. And so we're in trouble. It's supposed to be his dwelling place, his home. And he should be the one saying what happens in that home. What shows we watch in that home? What language we use on the phone when we've waited too long? And if you really could see God the Father and Yeshua, literally in your life, in your house, how different would we be? I'm trying to wake up to that more in my own life. And so we pray, our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will, your will be done in my life here on earth, just like your will is done up there in heaven. I want your will to be done in my life. I want your will to be done here on earth. He owns us now. So how are we doing so far? See, Pentecost made God move in to our lives and to our homes, which are our lives. I think there's too much of we. We want God to do what we want and we ask God to bless what we want instead of asking him to reveal his will and we get in line with it. I hope you hear the two sermons on total surrender. Our lives should really be showing off his life. More and more. How humbling that is, though, if you really think of it. Out of all the billions of people he could have chosen, it says in John 6, 44, that God the Father chooses us. God the Father calls us. And then he hands us over to Yeshua, to Christ, to work with, who then reveals the Father to us. Christ does that. But Father chooses us. God the Father selected us and called us. And gives us to Christ. Why did he call you? Why did he call me? So many, many, many other talented, more talented people, better people. Why me? Why you? Someday I'll give another sermon on that. I do have sermons on why God called you or chose you. Just put that in, why God called you. And you'll see sermons come up. One reason I know God says he calls us the weak of the world so that it's clear that it's not our doing that got us where we are to be someday. It's going to be God's, to God's glory. But anyway, God called us. And then he gives us his seed, his DNA, 
a bit of himself. So in time we begin to change, just like a begotten child in a womb begins to look more and more and more human as it gets older and older. And I hope you understand abortions are plain wrong. Psalm 139 and other psalms talk about how I knew you in the womb before you were born. If any of you hearing this are about to get an abortion, please don't. Please don't. Anyway, so what's happened to this point? We've gone through Passover. We've gone through the Days of Unleavened Bread. And usually, most years in the middle of that, Days of Unleavened Bread is Wave Sheaf Day. And I'm growing in comprehension that these days, these days are not about my part in it. These days are not about me and you. It's about God and Yeshua. And they include us, of course. But it's not about us. It's about their plan, what they're doing. And in their love, they include us. Passover, is it about us? I always heard for years and years, Passover pictures our repentance and coming to the cross of Christ and being washed with his, you know. And that's all true, but the focus was on me coming to the cross. No, Passover is about God. So love the world. Ungodly people, including you and me. The godly dying for the ungodly, as in Romans 5, verses 6 to 8, clearly says... Passover is about holy, perfect God and his son dying. And I say they both in a way died. Don't kid yourself. Any of you fathers who love your son deeply, you'd, you'd take a bullet for your son. You know you would. You'd risk your life for your son. The pain the father went through having to watch that and not be involved in stopping it, he couldn't. Because that was the plan, that he would be dying for us. Anyway, so we repented. We received the washing of our sins in the blood of the Lamb. 1 John 1, 7 and 9 says, But what led you there? Was it because you were so good? Was it because you started reading the Bible and decided to repent? What led you to repentance? Let's look at Romans 2, verse 4. Paul describes in Romans 1 the evil depravity of the entire world, of mankind, causing the wrath of God to come upon them. And now look what Paul says. Romans 2, verse 4, breaking kind of in the middle of one of Paul's many long sentences. Do you despise the riches of his goodness, God's goodness, forbearance and long-suffering? Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God, the goodness of God leads you to repentance? The goodness of God leads you to repentance. It was not the goodness of Philip Shields. It was not the goodness of your name. What's your name out there? Susan, Linda, Kelly, John, Pedro. What is it? Mahatma. What's your name out there? It wasn't your goodness that led you to repentance. It was God's goodness that drew you to him because he wanted to start working with you. So that's what Passover and all that pictures, the love and goodness of God for you and me that's what kept him nailed to the cross. It wasn't nails that kept him up there. Oh yeah, physically that's what we'd see. But what kept him on the cross was his love for you and me. So God led us to repentance. And God chose us, called us to that. We didn't choose God. Many of you think you chose God. Understand, come to understand that even though at one point you did choose God, the initial actions were not yours. Yeshua even told the apostles in John 15, verse 16, it's during the Passover, the, the final Lord's Supper discourse, John 15, verse 16, you did not choose me. I chose you. Peter, James, John, drop those nets, come and follow me. Matthew, Levi. I don't want you to keep being a tax collector. Come be one of my disciples. And so on. I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And so on. But I chose you. You didn't choose me. John 15, 16. So anyway, we, anyway, we repented at Passover. And we received the blessings of accepting the blood of Christ that justifies us, removes the wrath of God, reconciles us, redeems us, and many, many things. 
I have a sermon, in fact, on the many, many things that Passover does. And then in the days of leavened bread, I used to think of these days as picturing me now, having put sin out of my life and living a life completely, seven days completion, sin free. And then I just woke up one time and realized that nobody, not the ministers, not me, not the good people I thought were good in church, nobody was being perfect after their baptism, after Passover, and so on. I used to think it's about me living a, part, a life apart from sin now, but I've come to understand, I wrote a blog on, a blog on this, uh, who and what is unleavened bread, picturing in reality, a recent blog, only Christ is the pure unleavened bread with no leaven in it. Only Unleavened bread can only truly picture Christ or Christ in us. He is the perfect, sinless, perfect being. Even after Passover, we picture taking him inside of us. We eat unleavened bread for seven days, picturing taking Christ, taking Yeshua inside of us. And in the year Christ died, Christ is resurrected between the first and last day of unleavened bread. On wave sheaf day, he goes up to heaven, which was a Sunday, as our wave sheaf. Leviticus 23, 11 describes this as that first fruit wave sheaf is waved or raised up to heaven to be accepted in your behalf for the rest of the harvest. So he goes up to present himself to God the Father. Remember John 20, 17. He says to Mary Magdalene, Mary, don't cling to me. You can't hang on to me. You can't touch me. I have to go be accepted by the Father first. I must go to my God and your God. I must go to my Father and your Father. That's what he said. Yes, and Jesus does have a God. His God is God the Father. The Father, God the Father, is greater than Jesus. How many times did Jesus say that? Paul says that. The head of the wife is the husband. The husband's head of the uh, wife and the head of the husband is Christ. And the head of Christ is God. I think that's in 1 Corinthians 11 around verse 3, somewhere around there. But anyway, Christ is resurrected. He goes up to be accepted on our behalf. But we soon find out we need help. Much more help. God comes and lives inside of us. If we would just tell God and Yeshua through the Spirit, please have the run of the house. Please have the run of my life. Please direct me. Please, we say like Solomon when he was first made king, for I don't know how to go in or come out. I don't know how to go out or come in. I, I, I don't know my way around here. Show me thy way. Show me. Open my eyes to see your wondrous truths. Please. And of course, that won't happen if you and I aren't praying first thing every day. I got away from that for a while, be honest with you. I'm back to it. Get up, go to the bathroom. And if my dog's whining already, it's got to take the dog out. Okay, and that's done. Then I pray. If I can pray before taking the dog out, I can. But I, I, I usually let my, myself and the dog go to the bathroom. Then, then I pray. Make sure you put God first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all the things you're worried about are going to happen. Please don't check your cell phone first thing in the day. That will totally put your mind off of God. Please don't do that. Seek first the kingdom of God. Get on your knees. Head on the carpet. Bow down. Worship him means to bow down with your head way down. Or head on the bed. If you have real bad arthritis, can't get back up or whatever, God understands. But I, I try more and more with head on the carpet. Are you hearing this? So we need this help. So what does God do? God says, I'll give you my own holiness. I'll come live with you. And with God's Spirit, we now have the indwelling of the one who's holy, and we become saints. We become holy. Some of you don't want to be called saints. If Paul was writing to you, he'd say to the saints that are in London, England, or the saints that are in Leesburg, Florida, or wherever you live. Saints mean holy ones. And forget the Catholic definition of saints. That's not the biblical one. A saint is simply someone who has and being led by God's Spirit. Period. So you and I become saints, meaning holy ones. Folks, if you don't believe you can ever be holy, I want to remind you that if dirt can be holy, 
And we are really, flesh becomes dirt, right? But anyway, if dirt can become holy because of God's presence, then yeah, you and I can be holy and saints as well. Remember what God said to Moses in Exodus 3, verse 5. Moses, the place upon which you stand is holy dirt, holy ground. So take off your sandals. See, one, that's one of the changes, by the way, between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, God had them take their sandals off. The priests wore nothing as they served God in the temple. Moses had to take his sandal off and keep his distance. So did Joshua in Joshua 1.16. I covered that in the last sermon. Very same words, almost identical. Joshua, I come as commander of the Lord of the army of the Lord's hosts. I mean, commander of the armies of, yeah, the Lord of hosts. The place upon which you stand is holy ground. Take off your sandals. In the new covenant, we picture, we, we are picturing God the Father as being the good father who welcomes his prodigal son, his sinful son, who's coming back to him. And what does he do? He puts his sandals on. Give him new sandals. And there's a uh, and he hugged him and held him close. Big difference between old and new covenant. Be sure you hear my sermons on that. Anyway, we become the holy temple of God by his spirit. And because of Pentecost, we become the temple of God because of the Holy Spirit. And so Father is so willing to welcome you into this covenant relationship with him and with his son. You're going to marry his son. He seals it with the Holy Spirit. God wants you to have it. He wants you to have it. Uh, Yeshua said, if you are willing to give good gifts to your children, you guys all being evil know how to do, give good gifts. How much more will my Father in heaven give his Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I think that's in Matthew 7. So it's a marriage covenant with his son. A covenant requires faithfulness. And it was on or around Pentecost when God married Israel in Exodus 24 and 25. And to help us stay faithful, he wants us to stay faithful, he gives us the Holy Spirit. He knows we'll sometimes fail. And there's a verse, in, I think it's in 2 Timothy, that says, though, we, though you or we are, are faithless, he will remain faithful because he cannot deny himself. So he brings you into his family as one of his sons and daughters. And so hear my sermon, Your Breathtaking Destiny. Just type that into the search bar. Breathtaking destiny. Now, what happened when I said God sealed it? When a man proposes to a woman in our society, what do we do? We, we buy an engagement ring. This is my wedding ring, but we buy an engagement ring for our wife-to-be. And with this ring, it is a commitment to marry that in the months ahead, don't go more than months, guys, but in the months ahead, we commit to marrying this lovely lady in front of us. It's our earnest down payment. It's our guarantee of marriage. It's our pledge. Now, I want to bring out something I brought out before, but God gave his spirit as a promise commitment that you and his son will get married and that he will be there for that. Matthew 22, verse 1, a king put on a wedding for his son. Okay, where's the king? God the Father. Look up my sermons on uh, the wedding of the Lamb if you want to learn more about the wedding, where it is, when it is, who's going to be there. And the one who did the actual creating, God created all things through Jesus Christ, and the ones who did the actual creating, Jesus Christ, is the one you and I are going to marry, the one who said, let there be light, and light be, light there was. Probably, that marriage will happen, I believe, on this very day in some future year, not far from now. The Holy Spirit, God has given us the earnest, it says in King James, or the uh, guarantee, it says in New King James, the earnest of the Holy Spirit. It's God's way of showing total commitment to finishing what he started in you. To me, that's so exciting. I am wearing, by having the Holy Spirit inside of me, and having God dwell inside of me, I have a commitment from God that he will finish what he started. Philippians 1.6 says that as well, that he will finish what he started in us. The Holy Spirit is his commitment for that. Now, here's what I found interesting. My wife and I were in Athens some years ago, and I was looking at the rings they had there. They had engagement rings. They had wedding ring, wings, rings. 
And I asked the lady, what do you call this in Greek? And she says, we call it Arabon or Arabona. And, um, and that word just kind of sounded familiar to me. It was the very same Greek word that's used for the earnest of the Holy Spirit. The same word they use today in Greece, today, for engagement ring. I think it can mean wedding ring as well, but I think it's engagement ring. A promise to fulfill the commitment to marry, Arabon. So when we read 2 Corinthians 1.22, which we'll put up now, who has also sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee, or as I would like to say, if you want to just define it, the words they use today, has given us the Holy Spirit as an engagement ring, as a pledge to marry. And in my notes, I'll, I'll show that that's also in a source called BibleTools.org. I'll give them the credit here. Modern Greek, Arabona is an engagement ring, of course. So, when, so I mean, it's a very exciting thing. So when the Holy Spirit came, came and on the day of Pentecost, we'll get far more into that in the very next sermon. So please hear the next sermon. Isn't that exciting, though? God says, I want to give you a pledge. Here's my wedding ring. Believe me, they had wings, wings. They had rings and rings and earrings galore in the Bible. So any of you who believe that we, we shouldn't be having rings or wedding rings, engagement rings, the Bible says we can. God uses rings. So God Most High wants to guarantee his commitment to you. So he gives you a part of himself. He puts his seed into you. He begets you into his holy family. And then he sets you apart and guarantees it all by giving you the Holy Spirit as the guarantee. And he is holy. We now become holy. It's, I just think that, it's, oh, Father in heaven, just thank you. God is, of course, faithful, completely faithful. Though we are sometimes faithless. He remains faithful. He remains faithful as he cannot deny himself. I might try to put the verse in that. I think it's in 2 Timothy 3. With God's spirit, a conversion process now begins to take place. He is now inside of us. He comes in and he cleans house. And the old, out with the old, in with the new, the new life. We have a part. We have to surrender. We have to open the doors. We have to let God come in. We have to let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Can we post that up here, Philippians 2.5? Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you. We have to use God in us. Uh, God with us is part of his name, Emmanuel. God with us. God is actually now in us. Not just with us, in us. In fact, there's a time when Yeshua said to the disciples, for God's spirit is with you and shall be in you. All right? There's so many verses coming to me right now that I didn't even have in my notes. With the Spirit, we are to put on the armor of God and stand strong in the armor of God and overcome by the power of His strength, Yeshua's strength, to fight sin. Now, God is holy, but we still have the other nature in us, so there's a war going on, and war we must. I've gone many long periods of time in my life when I wasn't warring at all. It's not even realizing there was a war. We're in the end times, folks. Satan has asked for you that he can sift you like wheat, Yeshua said to Peter. But I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you are, when you are converted, strengthen your brothers. Believe me, Satan wants to have you as well. You need to be praying first thing. You need to make that your habit. Whatever else you're doing, stop it. Pray first thing. Study a lot. Pray a lot. We have to use this. We have to fight like our lives depend on it because it surely does. <sighs> We must, over time, be changing. We must be changing, over converting. We must be converted. We must be transformed. Look at Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. We're saying, open the, I'm opening the door to you, God. Come and live in me. 
I present myself to you as your bond servant, your slave, your own, you, you own me. What do you want me to do? What is your will? I want to do your will. Like your son, my king, who said, my will is not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Yeshua, what's your will for me? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy. Acceptable to God. Which is your reasonable service. Romans 12 verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world. But be changed. Be transformed. Be changing. By controlling your thoughts. By renewing your mind. I told you about a book that I really found so helpful. Get out of your head. She talks about her whole books about that concept. Being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Controlling every thought. To the obedience of Christ. That you may prove what's that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be transformed. So if you think about it, God our Father is very... Did you ever think about this? God the Father chose as the bride of his son. You and me. A bride to be, who at the time of her calling to be the bride... We all were very incompatible to Christ. If you don't think you were, then repent of self-righteousness. Because believe me, you were incompatible to Christ. He washed us in his blood. He gives us his bread, his life, the unleavened bread. He gives us his seed, his Holy Spirit. And now we have the ability to be transformed over time. For using God's Spirit, we can be changed to become in the very image, the exact replica, as close as that's possible, it's Christ, was the exact re replica of his Father. Over time, God's Spirit produces fruit. It's his fruit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of your efforts. It's the fruit of the Spirit. You become a different person because we receive his divine nature, that very nature of God our Father, who is in, and, and, and Yeshua, who is himself a, an exact copy of the Father. Look at 2 Peter 1, verse 4. 2 Peter 1, verse 4, By which you have been, uh, have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you, what's your name out there? You may be partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of God's very own way of being and thinking, his very own nature. God is love. God is joy. God is peace. God is not anxiety and worry. If you still have anxiety and worry, you have not surrendered to God who owns you. Whatever is causing you anxiety and worry, that's his problem, not yours. Surrender it. Go back and hear my sermons on surrender. Having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lusts. So we receive God's power, God's seed, God's presence, God's indwelling, God's mind, God's nature, much, much more by His Holy Spirit. In fact, I have a sermon titled 22 Things the Holy Spirit Does. I've listed four or five there. Now, if we only would let God have free reign in our lives, if only we would let Him, God lets us have free moral agency. God does not... Knock down the door. God knocks at the door. We have to open that door. Anyone who opens the door, I'll come have dinner with him. Consider the, and then we change. Consider how changed Peter was. He was so afraid. He denied his Lord three times in just a few hours. Three times went away weeping bitterly at his complete failure and meltdown. I don't know how many of us would have done any better. Then compare that to the Peter after he'd received the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, chapter 2. This bold Pentecost sermon he gives, which is all about Christ. Fifty days earlier, and, and a little, he had denied him. And now on Pentecost, that's all he could talk about as his Pentecost sermon was about Yeshua. Yeshua who had been killed and had been raised from the dead. God did not let his flesh see corruption. Pentecost, a new Peter. 
And he went on even to grow even more from there. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 16 to 18. You and I must also open our home, our lives to God and Yeshua, and let them transform us. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 16 to 18. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil, the veil that's over the eyes of the Jews right now, when the Torah is read, is taken away, it says here. Now the Lord is the Spirit. Remember I said the Holy Spirit is part of God's very presence. It's part of Him. It's part of what He is. The Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being, as you keep your eyes on Him, not on your failures, but on His victories, on His complete, total vanquishing of sin. As you keep your eyes on Him, beholding Him, we're being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by, the way it's happening, by the Spirit of the Lord. The Lord is the Spirit. And it's the Spirit of the Lord that is going to be transforming us and changing us. So this takes frequent prayer, folks. Much, much more than you're probably doing. Let, and don't look at your cell phone first thing. Stop that. That's a horrible habit. So let me wrap it up. God begets us. Gives us his divine seed. Brings us into his family. God and his, God and his Father, I mean Christ and his Father, come and live right inside of me. And come and live right inside of you. Our God Most High and Yeshua King of Kings come and make our lives their home. I want to give them the run of the house. I want them to ask me where they want me to live in the house. I want them to ask or to tell me what they want me to do. It's their home. It's their home now. My life's their home. There's no locked doors. There's no secret agendas. That shouldn't be that way. There shouldn't be secret sins that we keep God out of certain parts of our life, certain parts of our home. No, we surrendered everything. We reviewed God's love from his Passover through Pentecost and how it's all focused on what God's doing, his doing his work, and how God called you and me and chose us and led us to repentance. He's the one who did it. And then we received God's engagement ring, the Holy Spirit, the Arabon, a guarantee of marriage, the earnest, all the same word, down payment, earnest money, engagement ring, Guarantee. It's all from that Greek word, Adarabon. Anyway, this is just part, just the beginning of the magnificent meanings of the day of Pentecost. Much, much more coming soon, right next. Be sure to hear the one after this. Uh, we might have to just put up audios at first, but the videos will be up in time as well. Father in heaven, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you yourself, because you're omnipresent, you come and live in me and all those who are hearing this who are being called by you. When you give us your spirit, you have bought us and claimed us. and We become the temple of your presence. Make us holy. Make us take the sandals of our lives off in, holy, in, in deference to your holiness inside of us. And yet we also come and give you a big hug as you are our Father, our Abba, and Yeshua, our beloved brother, our King of Kings. Yes, our beloved. We love you. Help us to really cherish your calling. Help us to change, to grow and become more like you. Help us quit being conformed to this world, but be transformed. Father in heaven, please send Yeshua back soon. Let's get it over with. I can't wait. Bring his kingdom soon. We know it's going to be hard times before that. But what a wonderful kingdom of God you will let us have during the millennial reign of Christ and while you reign up there in heaven, Father. We thank you, we praise you, we love you. In Jesus' name, Yeshua's mighty name, our King, our Savior, and our Beloved. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a non-profit organization providing in-depth 
Biblical Studies, free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.